this will be a short film, one designed to acquaint the audience with recognized problems of crew seat failure in Army aircraft crashes under relatively moderate impacts. It is a recognized fact that seats designed to fail at loads from 7 to 15 Gs are inconsistent with the more substantial and crashworthy structure surrounding the seat and even more inconsistent with the tolerance limits of the occupants. A detailed analysis of five helicopter crash tests reveals the vertical acceleration forces encountered on both the cockpit floor and in the pelvic cavity of the pilot dummies. These crashes simulated severe but survivable accidents experienced at altitudes between 35 and 100 feet. Our consideration of the vertical crash forces is not by arbitrary choice. It is precisely these vertical accelerations which the human body is least capable of resisting. By superimposing the curves of horizontal accelerations over the NACA curves of human tolerance, we find the impact acceleration levels generally below the acceptable tolerance limits. But with vertical forces, it is a different story. Almost all of the data points fall within the minor or severe injury zone. Human tolerance to deceleration is dependent upon many factors, but perhaps the most important is the seat and restraint system. Occupants restrained in forward-facing aircraft seats by only a lap belt have a tolerable threshold probably not more than 25 Gs. The same individual with a shoulder harness and thigh straps can withstand forces up to 60 Gs for short periods of time. On the basis of the available human tolerance data, it would seem that the design criteria for a crew seat and restraint system would be on the order of 25 G for two-tenths of a second and 45 G for one-tenth of a second in both transverse and lateral directions and 25 G for one-tenth of a second in the vertical direction. These figures are up to five times greater than those currently defined for most military crew seats. Here is the real crux of the problem. The individual is capable of withstanding up to 25G vertical accelerations. The crash develops acceleration peaks as high as 200Gs at the floor. Obviously, some method of deceleration attenuation is required between the floor and the individual. One of the most obvious techniques is to export the energy absorbing capabilities inherent within the aircraft structure itself. However, in most helicopters, there is often little structure between the seat and the lower surfaces of the aircraft, or what structure exists is of marginal value under crash impacts. Another technique is the use of some energy absorbing device or material which will permit progressive deformation in a nearly rectangular stress strain pattern so that these brief high acceleration peaks can be brought within a 25G threshold. Let us evolve an equation which would provide a basis for computing the necessary initial height or cushion thickness of such a device or material which can be employed with a seat to accomplish our objective. Vertical impact velocities of approximately 55 to 60 feet per second are about the maximum that can be sustained and still be considered survivable in helicopter crashes. Plotting against cushion thickness for a maximum usable strain of 100%, we can arrive at representative design acceleration curves. Factors for the deformation of aircraft structure and strain percentages of less than 100% complete the basic equation pictorially. Let us take an arbitrary point on the curve. An impact velocity of 43 feet per second and a design acceleration of 35 Gs. If the aircraft structure deformed only two inches and if a usable deformation of 50% is assigned, it is theoretically calculated that a cushion thickness of about 15 inches placed under the seat would perform satisfactorily. How well does this equation check out in dynamic testing? Here is the same situation, 43 feet per second, a 35G measurement in the pilot dummy pelvis, a two inch structural deformation. The height of the paper honeycomb cushion under the seat, 14 inches.
This utilization of the wasted space under the seat is just one technique of energy absorption. Others have been tried which are predicated upon accepting greater structural deformation. For example, this overhead suspension system combines 16 inches of structural deformation with only 5 and 1 half inches of seat travel to bring the loads to within tolerable physical limits. Throughout this film, we have drawn data from crash tests on rotary wing aircraft fully aware of the fact that the vertical forces in fixed wing aircraft crashes are generally of a lower magnitude. However, this decade will see the percentage of helicopters in the Army inventory rise substantially. More and more men will be carried by rotary wing aircraft more often. Perhaps even more important, the Army is currently conducting a number of VTOL projects, several of which are designed to carry troops. It is obvious that if a crash of a VTOL occurs during hover or transition, when there is little aerodynamic lift, that the impact forces will approximate those for rotary wing aircraft, or be even greater. It is strongly recommended that the design criteria outlined in this film be incorporated in specifications for all Army aircraft. Put crashworthiness into the aircraft at its most logical place, on the drawing board, during the preliminary design phase. By applying suitable design techniques, some of which have been discussed in this film, occupant protection against crash impact forces can be provided up to the survivable limits of the structures in which they are flying. This film is a brief summary of a complex subject. Detailed information is contained in U.S. Army TRECOM Technical Report 63-4.